I guess I really want to start, Janet, with, with you and with the team at Studer and your parent company, Huron. Um, in addition to the moments that we met uh, at the national agenda, I did a little work with the Florida Go Gulf Coast University introducing improvement science to that institution with the help of Janet and Julie and Ryan and Pat. Uh, and it's just an amazing team. And I want to thank all of you, those of you from Studer that I didn't know until yesterday and today. And I want to give a shout out to Deborah, who is stationed at the desk and meets every need that you could ever have. So you have a great team, Janet. I just want to thank you and thank everybody that was invited and, and sat here yesterday and took in all the, all the wealth of information that we had. So I'm privileged to be here, very privileged to be here. And um, I can tell you, I don't sit still at a conference and I heard every keynote yesterday from almost beginning to end. I might have been a late a few minutes but uh, I think what we were doing yesterday is talking about a theory of leadership. And I think uh, the first administrative leader, I would call it leadership position that I assumed was 30 years ago. And it seems like every context in which I have arrived as the supposed to be leader, I have thought about what that means. Not only the variety of styles that you saw yesterday, <laughs> Uh, from the crown on, uh, which is not always <laughs> deserved, we all know that, uh, but really thinking about what matters most to you individually as a leader, no matter what the context. And I just think we had an array, a potpourri of, of theory uh, about how to get this work done, and I was just so moved and impressed by everyone who spoke. And I learned a lot, meaning, you're never too old to learn something new about how important leadership is. So my task this morning is to kind of set the stage on what systems do, what systems can do, what systems should do, and quite frankly, what systems shouldn't do. I had my first system experience at the University of Wisconsin, uh, University of Wisconsin, Mil Milwaukee. I had a great time talking to my Waukesha friends. Um, and often felt, they're now at the front table where they were yesterday, just, <laughs> just saying, I'm noticing, um, sometimes felt that my voice in Milwaukee was not heard over, let's say, the voice in Madison, the flagship, uh, the dominant uh, player in that system. So by the time, and I was a little difficult to deal with. I don't know whether you in your systems, and most of you are in one kind of system or another, uh, ever have been difficult or a pain in the side or so sorry, but I just have to speak. Uh, when I arrived at SUNY with 64 campuses and every sector from community colleges to medical schools and wishing and hoping that we could move together as a collective, I actually called the president of the University of Wisconsin system and publicly apologized to her and asked her to come to a national meeting where I could do that in front of everybody. Because I guess I just didn't really understand the value add of systems. I looked at it as some images persist, as bureaucratic, as administrative, as accountable, uh, miserly, whatever words, crazy. You know, I had these calls with 64 presidents, and occasionally one of them would forget to go on mute. <laughs> I am no stranger to what people say about you after you've held a big meeting where you're talking about getting our collective act together, and they're walking out in the hallway saying what they will say. I've now translated that as at least they heard you. <laughs> so uh, I, have a, I have a journey here, and um, it starts with this moment of transformation. Now, I never do this, but um, I think it's important. I, I don't bring my phone because I don't work it that well, but this is a definition of transformation. Oh, and wouldn't you know, it's from the Gates Foundation. Now, I might have been skeptical. I didn't want the Gates Foundation to tell me what transformation means, but this is pretty instructive, I have to say. Transformation is the realignment of an institution's structure, culture, and business model to create a student experience that results in dramatic 
and equitable increases in outcomes and educational value. Institutions transform by integrating evidence-based practices that create inclusive and coherent learning environments and leveraging a student-centered mission, catalytic leadership, strategic data use, and strategic finance in a robust, continuous improvement process. I'm done. Okay, I did that. So how in the world are we going to achieve that vision of transformation if you will, one institution at a time. So in the pain and agony of COVID, which started out as a healthcare crisis, but clearly was so brutally revealed in the, in the murder of George Floyd, and then the economic impact that is still with us today, this was a tsunami. It was beyond a pandemic. And you couldn't help but come away from this thinking there's a role for us. Well, our first and most important role, as you know, was to, was to go viral, to go, to go virtual, to go remote, go, go beyond our walls to see if we couldn't. Uh, and yes, something interesting is happening. You know why, Charlie? I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> Charlie knows me now. Uh, and, and so we had the headlines. We did something we've never done in the past. We made a major catalytic change in two weeks. I mean, who would have thought? We, we surprised ourselves, I think. We can't really believe that we went into that. We made decisions. Yes, we had committee meetings, but we got the job done. But, but in, in the face of all that, we started asking our system heads, you know, is that all there is? Once we go remote, these calls for transformation, they're, they're bugging us. They're saying to us, we have to go beyond simply taking care of the crisis at hand. And we turned, um, we, we don't have time to be students anymore, I'll just tell you that. But we did turn to the work of Ron Heifetz. The work of leadership is one of his most prominent books. And he talked about getting on the balcony. Now, I don't think this is a live picture. I have a lot of younger people who do my slides, and you will see the effect of that over time. He's not really standing on that balcony, but he said, we have to not only be in the field of battle, which the, the blocking and tackling of going uh, virtual or all the other things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to get above that, beyond that, we have to see what lies ahead. And even though there's a definition of transformation, that is really hard work. It's still a very intangible uh, concept that it's, it's hard to get your arms around it. And so we called this transformational moment our effort to get our arms around transformation system to system. So uh, it's important to say, well, who are the systems in the United States of America? Well, there are 65 of them. That's because Florida has quite a few. Texas has seven. Most uh, states have one to three or four. And our panel is very representative today of, of states with systems. And that's why we're here to talk about it. But what's amazing to me is if you put the four-year systems, and by the way, many of our four-year systems house community colleges, just as the State University of New York does and the City University of New York, but not all, of course, about 40%. If you put the footprint of the baccalaureate, the four-year systems together in one statistical analysis, we educate 70 five to 78 percent of the four-year undergraduate population in America. That doesn't mean there isn't room for Coker and all your colleagues, but I'm just saying if that footprint is us, then we have got to do something that reflects, represents, or honors that footprint. If we change, if we set our targets high and our values clear, we can really have an impact, not only in our state, but across the country. There are really only four states that don't have some form of a system, represented either, as, as Jim Purcell does, the state higher education executive officers, or as, as I do in the organization called the National Association of System Heads. So we've got a dial that we can move, and I think what's important is 
We have statutory authority. I don't, I don't, I don't use the word authority lightly, but at SUNY with 64 campuses, I will tell you, when it came to policy, when we finally got there after years of gnashing our teeth over transfer and the desire to have seamless transfer, it was the board that implemented the policy that affected the campuses. So to the campuses, engage now. This train is leaving. We're going to get a policy on seamless transfer. Your voice must be heard. But when it comes to the board, we've made a decision as a system. That is a powerful tool if used appropriately. So uh, with this, uh, these characteristics of, of system, uh, I will say that this little organization that I represent with this mighty, mighty footprint was really just a membership organization until it decided in its head it was going to be bigger, it was going to be greater. And we did know things about student success. We had been working on taking student success to scale. We do have an equity action framework that is a guidebook for our campuses and our systems to, to not only work at equity, but to be able to show that we are equitable and inclusive. So we weren't starting from scratch. But like you, when we have a big idea and we want it to sell across systems, we need a process. I just have heard this about five times in the last two weeks, this Drucker, what is it, culture, each strategy for breakfast. I usually make it up. I get it about half right. I do lunch instead of breakfast. But you get the point. This is a big deal, and we needed a process. And so not only did we convene the system heads of the of the several of the states that are represented on this stage today, we had what you would do in a, in a virtual environment, webinar, seminar, survey. We had design teams. We had people working on the ground, chief academic officers, DEIs, chief uh, uh, operational and chief financial oper uh, officers, as well as the system heads themselves. We also had the students who represent the governance bodies for students at system level and faculty representing faculty senates and faculty councils. So in the end, we were able to say, after months and months of work, 18 months of work to be exact, we were ready to launch not a big rethink, that was the process of getting there, but a powerful, powerful vision and goal for what systems could do together that could simply not be accomplished by individual campuses working in their own competitive environment. So you have to sort of get ready for this. Like I said, I have these young people who used to be student leaders at SUNY uh, who now own their own PR company, and so we hired them because they were so creative. Our uh, idea, our, our moment, our call has turned into uh, the power of systems, meaning what would happen if this big footprint decided it could work more effectively together, first at the system level and then system to system to system. And one example of that, quite frankly, is the seven systems of Texas, they're actually now trying to meet, trying to talk to each other, just in the great big state of Texas. So it's possible. It is, as I will begin to build, a theory of, of systems or a word that's being popularized called systemness. But it's all about advancing prosperity for the nation. And frankly, for Louisiana, um, Kim Hunter reads commitment to prosperity, the prosperity index in your state. We have national indices. You have prosperity indices. This is the work we are doing. So uh, in, in claiming that ground, we needed very clear and very explicit goals. One of the things I can't see is the little arrow on that. I could put my glasses on. Charlie, thank you. <laughs> so we have three goals, and they're pretty clear. The first of which is we are going to measure completion, but we are going to ascribe to the Lumina uh, measures, and there are four, and I thought there were only three, because there were only two, but when we realized the dial wasn't moving, if we only counted two and four-year degrees, we decided to count badges and certificates. Do you remember that? That happened about four years in to our moonshot announced by President Obama in 2008. 
And now we are counting, if you didn't know it, you know it now, some college but no degree. That's a much more amorphous measure, but the data strongly suggests that if you've had even a few courses in college, you're going to be better off in uh, life and work. So that's our first measure, and that's not going to be easy because we do not have a system by system database in this country. So how are systems going to claim that they can move the dial when we don't have a system to system database? So another challenge, uh, another problem that we have to overcome. And secondly, we do want to measure social mobility. It does matter that campuses are moving students to what is typically referred to as the middle class. We, we want to stand for that. Now, there are a thousand measures. Well, maybe not a thousand, but I tend to exaggerate to make a point. There are a lot of measures of prosperity. We've got to figure out one that will suit our various uh, member campuses. Uh, we have 45 member systems, but another 20 we are recruiting for the 65 across the country. What if we had the same database, the same metric system to measure not only completion, but social mobility. And then I think rather humbly, we have to take more responsibility for the cost of college, for debt, for debt removal, debt reduction. And even though systems, the table that uh, I'm sitting with has had a pretty good financial year, I'm hearing, because the state has to step up too. We know that. But we have ways. We know that we have offloaded the cost of college to fees and things that are beyond the cost uh, through straight tuition. So those are our three goals. And behind those goals are these five imperatives. Um, I'm leaving uh, at the break a copy of these imperatives because they might be useful to you uh, in the system uh, on the campus uh, in which you, uh, excuse me, reside. And uh, learning is first and foremost. I think it really translates to um, a student-centered curriculum. But, you know, figuring out what that means, because it's awfully good to say, uh, is a whole different matter. And one of the biggest problems in learning that we hope to solve is the transfer dance. The two to two, the two to four, the four to two, the four to four, it's everywhere. And we banked on for years bilateral transfer agreements. Guess what? Less than 10% of the students who want to transfer want to transfer within your lovely bilateral agreement. They don't want to go there. They want to go over here. And we still live in the institutional boundaries that make that process very difficult. So we are going to unpack the, le the learning uh, impediments that we have created for our students. Of course, we're working on talent. Uh, I think that while we all are talking about career pathways, we have not convinced certainly business and industry and probably even the social sector that we really are responsive to their needs. We have to partner up in a much more specific way. And then thirdly, uh, we have developed an equity uh, framework that the, we think will guide our work in inclusion, and that's on the uh, NASH, National Association of System Heads website, uh, for your use as well. It's, it's really a supplement to what you would uh, probe if you were doing an accreditation or a self-study. And then um, we do need a new business model. Um, I um, was very careful in my many years of working with faculty uh, not to imply that we needed to be more corporate, uh, but thanks to Jim Collins and his little addendum to Good to Great, he took X number of pages to say, listen, folks, I'm not saying that universities need to be more businesslike and more corporate. You missed the point. The point is that what makes a business great is its, its commitment to discipline. We don't need to be more corporate. We need to be more disciplined, and we probably need a new, revised, turned upside down business model. It's one of our goals. And then uh, finally, we do need to um, work more as a system, more as a collective, more as a, a point of, of collaboration. Uh, and that's an anchor to the work of this. Um, this word is actually in Wikipedia called systemness. Um, John uh, Colbert did truthiness, and one of the students came in one day and said, you know, 
we keep talking about being a system. I think we should say we're all for systemness. I go, oh, okay. I was giving a state of the system address, and you got to keep people awake. You know, you got to engage them. So we had a big slide on systemness, and in the audience, somebody put it on Wikipedia, and the rest is history. <laughs> systemness: the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We are better together. It takes a village. What you know, hit, it, hit ourselves over the head. We have got to find a way to work more collaboratively. It was Bush 141 who said we need a thousand points of light. Hooray, victory. We now have a thousand points of light. The problem is we're not so glued together that we're working tirelessly, unequivocally in the same direction. And that's what these systems are trying to do. So our theory kind of looks like our convening power as a system our ability to embrace collective impact, that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, that we have very explicit and measurable goals, and then most importantly, at the end of the Gates definition of transformation, we are absolutely tied to improvement, and by that I mean, and you mean, the science of improvement. Not the desire to improve, the want to be better at getting better, but we actually have a methodology. So um, we have a, an institute for system improvement that we're standing up to teach ourselves how to use improvement. Now, for you, because of your work with Studer, this is old news. But to the large context of post-secondary education, we are still saying to people, Improvement is not our gig. We do not produce widgets. We are not on the factory line. We do not need improvement science. So we are, perhaps naively, certainly modestly, going to try to say to post-secondary education, this big footprint that we have, we are a science organization. We are a science-driven organization, except for how we deliver instruction, which we have not put to the scientific test and we plan training by training and more importantly as we are raising money for this agenda we plan to invest only in those systems that are employing um, improvement science so that's one vehicle that we are standing up for this effort the second is our commitment to uh, state by state uh, better policies taking old policies that get in the way of student success and adding new policies that enable student success. We had something in Ohio about how much you had to pay to get your transcript to get back in college. It was, for heaven's sakes, a state law. Do we need a law that tells us that we really don't want to charge for that transcript? We can find another way to identify the prior work of our students without charging them a fee. But we had to knock down a state law before we could do that. That's what this system work ought to be about. And then finally, we really ought to work more closely with the federal government. The word system is not in the language of the Higher Education Act. Of course, we can't seem to pass the Higher Education Act in how many, eight years uh, or more. But uh, even the Build Back Better uh, investment, which may or may not ever happen, does not have the word system in it. We have a sort of political crisis that uh, the state um, Shios, Jim, are helping solve. So that's really important. And um, it sort of comes with the territory. We are building a commitment. We are building a website. We are building a, a moment. We are building a population. We are getting funding uh, to support our three goals of completion, social mobility, and uh, bringing down the cost of college. This is uh, what I would call uh, mission impossible in some respects. We have one investor from California, the foundation called ECMC, which may be investing in your work, who said, you know what? I set aside a little pool of money for high risk agendas. You qualify. Getting these systems to work more effectively within their systems, without the push and pull of who's in charge, with the kind of proper amount of autonomy and inclusion, but getting systems to work across states, 
within states for the benefit of students who do not, do not see our boundaries. That's high risk, but very high reward. So my North Star, being an advocate now of systems and not really going away, wanting to be a part of something bigger than myself or my campus or my system. I'm driven by uh, a quote that I could say now <laughs> in my sleep. In the middle of creating uh, the Health Care Act, which ultimately got labeled Obamacare, David Leonhardt wrote a column in the New York Times, and his intro was, everybody's saying health care is America's greatest problem. And I think it is a challenge, and we need to think carefully about how we deliver health care to everyone. But I instead think that our greatest challenge is education. Education, educating more people, and educating them better is simply the best bet any society can make. That's my North Star. That's our North Star. And systems can be a part of that. I rest my case. <laughs> Thank you.